Good morning and welcome to Korea Today, live from Seoul. It's day two of the 20-day parliamentary audit. The ruling and the opposition lawmakers on the first day butted heads over the handling of the scaled-back basic pension plan and the Four Rivers project. An investment pitch that was supposed to take place at the end of this month will not likely happen. Find out which pitch I'm talking about in the headlines. And much to cover on yesterday's parliamentary audits, as well as Dennis Rodman, Rodman's latest trip to North Korea. Coming up on Unprint. Four of the world's most prized violins. I'll be back later with a very special classical music performance. Advancements in cybersecurity. Korea is making leaps forward in protecting its internet and smartphone users from debilitating attacks. We show you the technology behind this. And bisphenol A. It's used in cans, plastic products, and even receipts. We look at what effects BPA can have, especially on your children, and look at how to reduce the dangers on Tuesday, October 15, 2013. From Arirang News, this is Korea Today. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching Korea Today on a Tuesday morning. And happy Thursday, uh, happy Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. Yesterday in Incheon, the first international organization promoting free and fair elections um, opened its doors and set up its headquarters at the inaugural assembly of the Association of World Election Bodies. Now, over 320 delegates from around the world, they were in attendance. And Ian Bok, the chairman of Korea's National Election Commission was elected as the chairman. Mm -hmm. and President Park Geun-hye and UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon sent congratulatory messages for the launching of the association. And the organization helps to uh, wants to help build uh, fair elections in developing countries, especially by helping them build the necessary legal infrastructure and a framework. And it's really aiming to strengthen democracies around the world. And speaking of democracy, we voted today this morning on the topic of our opening. <laughs> That's right. And it was a fair vote indeed. Majority right. ruled. <laughs> and we voted on this one today. We practice uh, democracy day in and day out. <laughs> All right. right. We'll begin Korea today on this Tuesday morning with a look at the day's Headlines. Government officials were bombarded with a barrage of questions on various issues from lawmakers on the first day of this year's parliamentary audit on Monday. Now, one topic that gained much attention was the Park Geun Hye administration's recently revised pension plan for the nation's senior citizens. Given that the president had already apologized for not being able to follow through with her key presidential pledge, the ruling Senate party said it was regrettable to see the issue being used as a political tool by the main opposition Democratic Party. But DP lawmakers said they have their reasons. Are you saying an issue this big was announced after being reported only verbally without the minister's signature of approval? Can you call this the government of the Republic of Korea? There was one time when a written authorization was given. It was when I signed the legislation to go through preliminary announcements. Other than that, there are no signatures on the documents related to the basic senior citizen pension. The DP claims the presidential office forced the pension plan upon the now-resigned welfare minister, Chin Young. It also went on to condemn the administration for shaking up the core of the national pension scheme. And a sight not seen that often, but there was also a topic where ruling and opposition parties joined forces. Lawmakers, regardless of their party affiliates, had many similar questions about what the science ministry had done so far, especially regarding the administration's push to build a so-called creative economy. I hear other ministries do not cooperate with the science ministry very much on issues regarding building a creative economy. And it seems that's why there are talks about creating a joint ministerial business unit. The reality nowadays is that not only the public but also experts don't even know what on earth a creative economy is. Now, but the minister countered these remarks. 
I've received more responses and ideas than expected from the public on the ministry's online platform. Experts are volunteering to share their knowledge and experiences, and it's becoming very active. Now, Che said the government's drive to build a creative economy is not something that can produce short-term results, adding that the ministry is planning on fine-tuning its plan by the end of the year. And moving on, South Korea has indefinitely postponed a joint inter-Korean investment pitch for the Kaesong Industrial Complex aimed at attracting foreign capital. The event, which was originally slated for October 31st, has been put on hold. Seoul's Unification Ministry explained there were still many issues to be resolved, including customs inspection rules and setting up mobile and internet connections. The initial agreement was made as the two Koreas resumed operations at the Kaesong complex after a five-month-long shutdown. An official from the South Unification Ministry says Seoul is looking to set up a new date and plans to continue discussing the matter with Pyongyang. North Korea has not officially responded to Seoul's calls as of yet. At least 40 percent of nuclear reactor parts exported from Japan over the past decade have bypassed safety inspections, says Japan's Mainichi Shimbun. The report shows nuclear reactor parts worth some 520 million U.S. dollars were shipped to nearly 20 countries, including Korea, Taiwan, Australia and Germany. The unchecked parts include reactor pressure vessels as well as control rod drives, which oversee the rate of nuclear fission. Some parts that were exported to five countries, including China and the U.S., were found to have gone through safety checkups, but the report says it cannot confirm whether all parts were inspected. And good morning, everyone. It was an intense opening day of parliamentary audits yesterday at the various committees of the National Assembly. And the newspapers reflect that. We'll go ahead and begin with a look at the front page of Pyongyang Shimun to see how it covered yesterday's audits. The headline reads, Park Geun-hye indirectly pressed on broken presidential pledges. That is, the opposition party at most of the committees questioned her people on a number of broken promises. One Democratic Party lawmaker, Min Byung-do, said some 50 key pledges from basic pension, free childcare, half-price university tuition to the so-called happiness housing were either downsized or cut out altogether. Another DP lawmaker, Kim Gwang Jin, said he confirmed that the pledge to reduce the country's required military service to 18 months was first postponed and now taken off from the government agenda. Rival parties spent the better part of their day debating such ongoing contentious issues as the Four Rivers Restoration Project, the purported distorted history textbooks, the timing of the transfer of wartime operational control, and basic pensions. So certainly no shortage of issues to discuss there. Now, Chungang Ilbo's headline related to the parliamentary audits reads, Yun Byung's he hints at TPP participation. There is consensus in and outside the government. At the Foreign Affairs, Trade and Unification Committee, Korea's Foreign Minister Yun Byung's he told lawmakers that the tide of opinion is turning on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, also known as the TPP, the world's largest free trade negotiation currently underway between 12 countries, including the U.S. and Japan, but excluding China. What was one seen with skeptical eyes is now being considered with consensus both inside and outside the government, he said, as holding merit for the national interest of Korea. He said, according to the paper, it was now not a matter of if Korea would join, but when, as the government considers a time frame appropriate to bring the issue to the fore. Meanwhile, Cho Son Ilbo's uh, related headline has new information from the Committee on National Defense. Headline reads that the defense minister is considering U.S. core missile defense, the SM-3. The SM-3 guided missile, the paper says, is the core of the U.S. and Japan's missile defense systems. Uh, taking off from the Aegis, the SM-3 would be able to destroy a North Korean ballistic missile at an altitude of 150 kilometers. The 
The paper notes that this is not the, or rather this is the first time that Defense Minister Kim Guan-jin has admitted to the consideration as including the SM3 in Korea's MD could incite criticism that it is becoming a part of the U.S. missile defense system. And scooting right over to Tonga Ilbo now, its front page image shows the expressions of the various ministers in the hot seat yesterday. From the left is Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin, Education Minister Ho Nam Su, Land Minister Ha Seung Hwan, and Foreign Minister Yoon Byung Se. They are deep in thought. Headline under it with a bit of an attitude reads Figures, Pak Government, first parliamentary audit begins with a limp, noting the battle-like atmosphere at those various sessions. We'll go ahead and leave that story there and turn to another interesting headline at the very bottom. Let's go ahead and scoot on over to it. It's a paraphrase of what former NBA star and self-described good friend of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, Dennis Rodman, is said to have said. Now the headline reads, Kim Jong-un asked about Miami beaches and joked about DPRK being the most dangerous country in the world. The paper says it spent about one month speaking to various sources familiar with Rodman's two-day trip visiting Kim Jong-un last month. The inside pages also had this picture of the two meeting each other. The article chronicles tidbits from his September visit, such as a beachside drinking session with the leader's family members, at which Kim is said to have joked that North Korea was the most dangerous country in the world because his defense staff liked to drink too much. Rodman is also said to have said that Kim drives a luxury car himself, enjoys horseback riding, swimming, and jet skiing, and has an uncanny interest in the U.S. capital of Washington, D.C. All right, we will leave that newspaper there and finally wrap things up with a look at Mail Business newspaper. It has the three latest Nobel laureates on its front page. And the headline reads, this year's Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences jointly awarded. And as you can see here in the inserted picture, three American professors shared the honor, Robert Schiller, Eugene Pharma, and Lars Peter Hansen. The paper says the award this year went to scholars on finance market theory as opposed to mathematical law. And here's a bit of trivia for you. It is the sixth time in the prize's 44-year history that the prize was shared by three individuals. And with that, we'll wrap your look at what's in print on this Tuesday. Next up are your closing numbers from Monday's Market Action. It's 7.13 a.m. and it's time to get a check on the weather. But first, we're expecting first snow in the Gangwon Province. The season's first snow in Gangwon Province. How romantic. Uh, I want to be in Gangwon Province. But we're, we're expecting rain here in Seoul, uh -huh. so what well, a drag, right? It seems just like yesterday I was pushing your car out of the snow, and now it's already back to wintertime. Be winter ready for time, that right? again. <laughs> I don't think it's wintertime yet. <laughs> Good morning, Dami. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm reporting live from Gangbukgu Seoul. Now, on this Tuesday morning, we are starting off with gloomy skies and temperatures with a chilly 13 degrees Celsius. It looks like here in the central regions, later in the afternoon, we will be seeing slight drizzles and receiving just about 5 millimeters of rain or less. However, the story is a bit different over in Gangwon Province. Uh, there might be signs of first snow. However, in the East Coast regions, there are gale wind advisories and you can expect up to 70 millimeters of rain in those areas, so please do be cautious. 
Now, uh, once these nationwide showers do clear up, it looks like starting tomorrow, both our lows and highs will significantly drop. So you will have to start organizing your closets, take out those thicker jackets, and prepare yourselves for the cold weather. Let's now go ahead and take a look at the numbers around the peninsula. Seoul's highs will only reach the mid-teens, Taejeon at 18, Taegu at 20, Gangneung's lows and highs both will be the same at 13 as Gwangju and Jeju will rise to 22 degrees. Now tomorrow morning, our mercury levels are going to dip into the single digits, so make sure to dress accordingly. I'll be back in a few moments. So two days from now, the Seoul Conference on Cyberspace 2013 will kick off right here in the capital, bringing together some 1,000 people under the theme Global Prosperity Through an Open and Secure Cyberspace. And just in time for this, we've prepared a segment on cybersecurity. Uh -huh. And we've seen cyberspace security compromised in a number of different ways, including back in March, a massive attack that resulted in the crash of many computers in uh, the uh, country's major broadcasters as well as financial institutions and that uh, really highlights the need for these conferences and joining us is David Kim to talk more about Korea's cyberspace security technology. Good morning. Good morning. David. Good morning. Well you guys have smartphones. Everybody has smartphones these days. Mm -hmm. Now one of the things that we have to remember is smartphones are mobile computers. So these devices are now just as vulnerable to phishing attacks, cyber attacks that PC computers have been. Mm. So Let's take a look at some of the things that we have, some of the options that we have to deal with some of these threats. In the face of the March 20th cyber attack and an increase in the number of hacking cases, cybersecurity is becoming more important than ever. And with this comes a growing emphasis on cybersecurity that can prevent these attacks from occurring. Along with the global IT trends to enhance cybersecurity, Korea's Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute is also boosting its research in this field. And one of its latest technologies is the Internet Radar. Internet Radar technology detects cyber attacks in real time and allows people to respond as they occur. The Internet Radar collects security information in real time and connects it with the geographical data to produce 3D visualization of the user's network environment. It shows you the area that has fallen victim to hacking and the scope of the attack. And not only that, it has an integrated maintenance system, which not only blacklists information such as the origin of the malicious codes, but also shows you the physical location of the source. The technology also allows for the swift detection and response to the spreading of zombie PCs in various parts of the world. We can reduce the amount of time it takes to understand the scope of damage from cyber attacks down to 30 minutes. And the tracking technology, which used to take anywhere from two weeks to one month, can be reduced to 30 minutes so we can identify the origin of the attack. Meanwhile, phishing scams using text messages, commonly also known as smishing, are also becoming more elaborate. There's a mobile vaccine that blocks these smishing messages when you receive them. There are also various mobile applications. There's also technology that blocks personal information from being leaked, even if you have access to smishing message. This technology, which is based on the security element Mobile Trusted Module, completely blocks spam or the hacking of mobile devices, prevents personal information from being leaked when making payments, and cuts off illegal access. A separate device within the hardware saves and processes the important information at once, which is why it is safer than existing smartphone security technologies. And with more people making payments using their smartphones, smart wallets, which authorize the user and issue receipts through mobile phones, are becoming more popular. If you receive a paper receipt and throw it away, personal information can be leaked that way. But with the mobile e-receipts, you won't have to worry about that problem. A technology called S-PIN allows users to input their PIN number without worrying about exposure in public settings. The user must match up each digit with a particular color that has been preset on the phone. 
Losing personal information can lead to not only financial losses, but on the broader scale, it can threaten national security. And with this, the importance of cybersecurity and related technology will continue to increase. So this internet radar technology visualizes cyber attacks and you can visually see mm -hmm. where these cyber attacks are coming from. How is it different from the current security measures that we have? Well, this internet radar takes the location into account on a much deeper level than current existing uh, defense mechanisms and it combines it with a graphical information system for deeper analysis which gives us a much better picture of where attacks are coming from, how attacks are progressing and it gives us a better line of defense against these types of things, especially things that spread, creating zombie PCs that where it takes over your PC to then launch an attack on another server or another computer. Mm. Hmm. I'm curious to know about that chip that we saw in the report. I mean, those are not, we can't get our hands on the chips as of yet though, it's not commercialized. Not quite yet, but once these things do become commercialized, um, well, I guess a little, better, a little bit of an explanation would help. Think of all of your personal data that you keep at home in your safe. Mm -hmm. This is what this chip does for your smartphone. So all your personal information, which you don't want other people getting, is on a specially separate encrypted chip so that mm. programs and websites just can't access them on their own. Huh. They have to have special permission for you to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's that personal information that's been getting out and also in the hands of people who use it maliciously. But uh, without downloading or buying anything, paying any money, how can just regular everyday users prevent uh, uh, being a part involved in phishing scams or, or downloading some malicious codeware that they don't if want on their computer? If it's possible at all, I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Well, all the rules that we learned about how to protect ourselves when we're browsing the web on our computers, all these rules apply when you do it on your, on your smartphone. The whole smishing thing, SMS phishing, it will send you a web link or a phone number to call. And especially with a smartphone, when the phone number is linked in there, oh, I just press it and call it. Mm -hmm. That's just like pressing any link in an email. Mm -hmm. If you don't know it, don't trust it. If it actually happens to be your bank, physically call the number yourself. If you, or if you have your bank's number saved, mm -hmm. use that number to call. Don't use the number that's linked. Mm -hmm. Only use what the numbers and sources that you trust. Again, the first line of defense first line of cyber defense is always the user. Mm -hmm. As long as you prevent yourself from doing thoughtless, stupid actions, uh -huh. <laughs> you'll prevent your, you'll keep your system safe. Right. Be I, smart about it, right? I was yeah. scrutinized for people, from people though, by, cause I ignored all the uh, numbers that I didn't know and I didn't respond and they were like, why are you not responding to my text? <laughs> being too cautious. Yeah, too I, cautious. I, I do the same thing. Use common if sense, I don't know the yeah. number, <laughs> and if it's not a message that's personalized to me with, of person I might recognize, I actually ignore the text mm. message. Well, tell us briefly about the global conference that's taking place starting uh, the day after tomorrow. Well, the Seoul Conference in Cyberspace, this is a global conference of the largest of its type so far, where they're bringing together government officials, industry experts, uh, international organizations, where they're going to try to lay down the groundwork for uh, the rules that they want to apply for international cyber attacks and cyber crimes. Mm -hmm. right. This is actually a key issue because these attacks usually take place across borders, but we have, every country has its own national laws to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to come lay the groundwork for agreements so that they can better uh, respond to these cyber right. attacks. And the participants are expected to adopt a joint statement the afterwards, soul, right? The sole petition. That's right. right. Well, thank you, David, for that story. Thank you. All right, still ahead on Korea Today, a notable classical music ensemble in Korea embarks on a special tour featuring four violin soloists with four very rare violins. Seven different pieces from different time periods all in one evening. And our reporter Im Yun Hee has more coming up, so stay tuned. We are back for our week-long Culture Korea segment. We'll, we'll be introducing you to various cultural aspects of Korea. Now, there are city dwellers who have access to many different cultural activities, plays, musicals, theater, you name it. It's all there. But people that live in rural areas, children and adults alike, they have a hard time accessing um, these performances because of the raw distance that they would have to travel. Mm -hmm. So for our second installment of our culture special, we're going to take a look at a welfare program 
program that hopes to ensure that everyone, people of all ages and backgrounds, have access to new cultural experiences, culture for all. So take a look. There is world of art and culture for people of all ages to jump into and enjoy. From a little source of inspiration in daily life to power that helps resolve conflict across society and all generations, culture has become a new leading power in the 21st century. We invite you to places that are going through culture transformations. This is an elementary school at a small village in Kangon province, far away from the city. A certain change has been happening at this school, which only has 20% in student numbers compared to city schools. It's because of a special class that has been held for the past three years. More popular than any other class is the culture and arts program led by the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism. It's not just sitting at the desk. The class involves singing, dancing and having fun. And this is exactly why children enjoy it so much. There was a desperate need for programs such as these in small villages, far away from the cultural benefits that others in cities experience. Through various club activities, students are able to experience culture and also gain more knowledge in the field through a professional art teacher. The greatest change has been in the children themselves. The children have become much more expressive, and I have to focus better. Since there are many group activities, we have also seen an improvement in their social skills. This year, the school is pushing together a special creative musical that all the school students will take part in. The students went through a competitive audition to fill each role and the practice is in full swing. Even during breaks, they gather around to practice their lines. And it's during moments like these when they become more like professional actors than mischievous children. The students are exceptionally focused with not many days left until the day of the performance. It's more meaningful because every single student of the school is taking part. And the gift from this arts program does not end at the teamwork and understanding each have learned as they pieced a big musical together. The power of culture comes from the fact that it can bring people happiness. The culture ministry is working on cultural welfare programs to ensure all people have access to this experience. This is so that there are ample opportunities for people to enjoy culture and arts throughout their entire lives. The values and needs are different depending on the age. If mass production in the age of modernization produced unified opportunities to enjoy cultural experiences, now individual demand is becoming more important. By providing diverse education in the arts, we can solve more social issues and create a society where people are more caring for each other. As a kindergarten in Seoul, there is someone here who has opened a new chapter of our life through culture. With cheers from the children, an elderly lady steps out. Yun Young Suk works as a storytelling grandmother for young children, and why they're listening to the children fall deep into Yun's world of tales. 
친구 되어서 사이좋게 지내자 새끼 손가락 고리 걸고 꾹. This time is not just for the students. Yun also gained something from the experience. If I give just a little bit to the children, they give me so much more back. On the days that I'm at the kindergarten, I'm happy all day. Since becoming a storyteller, Yun says her life is more full of energy. Only people like myself who work as storytelling grandmothers have access to this cafe. I print out pictures, color them, and use them in class. Yoon, who didn't have anything particular to do before this, was able to become a storyteller thanks to the support from the culture ministry. And this small change has brought a wind of transformation to her family as well. As she started working as a storyteller, she has become much brighter and more lively as well. The funniest part is, because she is so used to talking like a storyteller that she uses that kind of speech to me as well, as if I were a child. There's a Golden Age generation now different from the Silver Age generation. They have their own dreams and skills and shape their own future especially in the field of culture. This is a way to open a new chapter in their lives. Cultural activities may be easy for some to enjoy, but others still find it difficult. We have a support system for those who either have economic, social and geographic disadvantages and enjoying cultural activities by providing them with vouchers so that they can watch plays, movies or buy books. Culture vouchers provide concrete ways for people to enjoy cultural activities. It's a system that those without the time or money can benefit from. A wind of change that provides people of all ages with the opportunity to enjoy culture. This is one of the grand goals behind this movement. sweet picture there, <laughs> right? We normally do associate storytelling with grandmothers and mothers, you know, but where are the fathers and the grandfathers <laughs> in this equation? Why don't we see them reading? crushed your hope of becoming a storytelling grandpa yourself well, one you day, know, right? I might, I might want to reserve that as <laughs> well, a Well, this project career. is actually for women only uh, those age 60 years and older for now, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, this project started back in 2009, so it's now in its fifth year, and there are roughly 1,000 storytelling grandmothers Mm -hmm. across the country. <laughs> this is storytelling grandpas. <laughs> Maybe you can like initiate idea, that actually. plan, right? <laughs> and surprisingly, or not surprisingly, there is a competition. This year when the government was trying to add more grandmothers for story storytelling, the rate, the rate was, the competition rate was mm -hmm. five to one, mm, right? So you have to fight for this yeah, job. Yeah, you have to fight for this job. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's a good opportunity. It's a win-win situation, even for the teachers who are willing to travel that extra mile to teach the kids. I mean, it's a win-win situation. They get a job, children get education, it's mm -hmm. a good, it's and a good children case. children get to spend some time with the, you know, those cuddly grandmas. Right? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing that's, there's something special about, about, about an old, wise woman just reading you a story, right? right? But those culture vouchers, they seem like a great plan too. It's a, really is a very good um, thing that uh, they're providing to people from underprivileged families. A 50,000 won voucher, that's probably equivalent to about 47, 46 US mm -hmm. dollars right now, right? And then you get to use that for the year for cultural activities. Mm -hmm. Right, great story. All right, time now to go to the most cultured person of the bunch, I have to say, Ari <laughs> who is standing by at the National Rehabilitation Center. I thought you were coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. So back to you, Dami. Yep, Dami's the one that experiences everything. <laughs> Thank you guys. I'm back reporting live from the National Rehabilitation Center. Today is October 15th, which is Hing Chipanye Nal or White King Day here in Korea. So we have someone special here this morning. So without further ado, let's say hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so can you go ahead and tell us when White King Day was designated and why? Uh, the White Cane Day was designated by the World Blind Union to ensure the rights of people with visual impairment. 
On the 15th of October in 1980, the World Blind Union declared that the independent uh, identification of a white cane is not a symbol of incompetence, but a symbol of independence and accomplishment. Therefore, National Rehabilitation Center provides a disability experience program to the non-disabled. It is designed to increase the public awareness of people with disabilities and to highlight the importance of necessary improvements to public facilities for those who are disabled. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so um, just like she mentioned here at you know the National Rehabilitation Center, there are many experience programs, and of the many, I'm here at the Road Traffic Experience Program, which um, will give me a better idea of what it is like to be visually impaired. So I'm going to go ahead and first put on this mask so that you can't see anything in front of me. Okay. And then I'll, <coughs> I'll be getting the white cane and I kind of learned how to hold it earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and start my experience. They said you have to kind of move the stick back and forth, left and right. Uh, and this, the white cane will help you with um, any objects that might be in front of you. Oh, this is... Uh, All right, um, I think that was enough. Okay, don't know who to give it to. Um, oh, wow, oh, I got a lot farther than I thought it would be. And it was a lot more difficult than I thought. I definitely had to focus more on my other senses. Now, um, here at the National Rehabilitation Center, they do have many goals, and one of them is to overcome the boundaries of disabilities with a positive attitude toward people to realize the value of mankind. Now, if you'd like to experience it for yourself firsthand, then you should definitely go ahead, check their website, and register. Now, as you can see, the facility that they made is really great. Um, you know, you can really experience for yourselves what it is like to be visually impaired, and it does grow awareness as well. So uh, why not come on over to the National Rehabilitation Center and see things in a different perspective? I'm Idami, Korea Today. And now we're going to introduce you to a rare ensemble where you can enjoy the beautiful sounds of the world's most coveted violin, Stradivarius. And not just one, but four of them put together. And a reporter, Im Yun Hee, was there. How was it? How impressive was it? You know, I wish you guys had went. It was fantastic. It was absolutely phenomenal. But let me introduce the group first. It's the Erato Ensemble. Um, they just started their week-long tour. And, you know, they produced a very special event for this concert. Um, so, without giving away too much, but they had a, a, a Vivaldi concerto featuring four violins, and as uh, Min Jung said, it's a Stratovarius violin, and that is the rarest violin um, that people, people argue that it's the best violin ever created, mm -hmm. and there are only a few hundred left in this world. I see you smirking. You know, I, uh, <laughs> let's, get, let's get to the bottom of the pronunciation of it. Is it Stradivarius or Stradivarius or Stradivarius? Well, uh, Americans butcher all kinds of <laughs> <laughs> words, so I guess, yeah. But, uh, it's, right. it's whatever you want it to be, but right. I'll stick with Stradivarius. But anyway, let's take a look at this one-of-a-kind performance. Violins, violas, cellos. These are just a few of the string instruments that make up the Erato Ensemble. Formed in 2011, the Erato Ensemble is one of Korea's notable classical music chambers. And although it's still in its early years, it's already established itself with quite the reputation. Led by music director Yang Sung Sik, the Erato Ensemble is continually being invited to perform at concert halls around Korea. And for the past four months, the Erato Ensemble has been preparing a very special tour. Overall, we'll be playing seven different pieces. One of the key points of this concert and this, this program would be the Vivaldi for, for violin um, concerto, which will be played by four. Sword various. 
Having four Stradivari Youth violins performing together is an exciting experience for both Korea and the worldwide classical music followers. In one ensemble, having four Stradivari as soloists is a very rare and meaningful experience. During the 17th century, the Stradivari Youth family made over 1,000 of what is considered the best violin. And now there are only about 400 left, making it one of the most prized instruments in the world. Da Vinci, one of the best Stradivarius. In the year is 1714. Yeah. So soon, 300 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Stradivarius like this, like these, uh, will take 400 years to get to the top, and another 400 years to slowly die away. So its life is 800 years. Yes, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are actually uh, enjoying in our generations probably one of the top uh, uh, forms of the, these instruments. Yeah. I won the violin competition, it is called Munezuku Violin Competition, last March in Nagoya in Japan. So I could use this violin for two years for the winner's prize. The musicians rehearse right up until opening, making sure everything is just right. Tempos are sped up, while corrections are made. Everyone works collaboratively up until showtime. And as time goes by, the musicians develop a special kinship with each other. Play together and talking together, everything. So I really enjoy. This time I'm only Japanese, but I, really, I, I felt already very good friendship as a musician with them. Finally, the event is ready to begin. The only thing left is the audience's role to sit back and enjoy the music. You don't need to understand the music as, as a specialist. You can, you know, I, I, would say, I would say you can fall asleep sometimes in a concert. We, no, but falling asleep um, in a concert, I think is one of the best way to enjoy the music because, because it means that you are enjoying it, you are relaxed, you are happy to be there. Hmm. Wow, it's pretty impressive, right? It's very beautiful. Right. Stradivarius, or Stradivarius, as you would want to call it. It's pretty amazing. But what are some of the other pieces that they're performing? You know, the ensemble was very proud of their Schomburg piece, which is a very difficult piece to perform. Uh, they also covered a very famous Bach concerto, along with a few other pieces for a total of seven uh, for the program for the night. Now, the tour started in Jeonju, and tonight they'll be in Gwangju. And they'll keep touring around Korea for a total of five performances, and they'll finish off the tour this Sunday at the Seoul Art Center, where they'll have uh, a very famous composer, Shlomo Mintz, visit. So Ooh. it should be a treat for the audience. So you guys should go check it out that night. Thank All you. Right. A, chamber, a chamber orchestra featuring an ensemble and four Stradivarius violins. This has to be one that you want to see all in one spot. All right, thank you very much, Uni. My pleasure. And still ahead on Korea today on our health check segment, it, it's a substance that's carried in our foods through the containers that our food is carried in. The chemical compound bisphenol A, or BPA, is said to have an effect on children's learning abilities and bring about behavioral disorders. We look at the hidden dangers behind BPA.
All right, it's time to play ball. Now, here's a question. Do you believe in miracles? Well, chances are if you're a Tucson Bears fan, you do. Now, game five of the first round of the KBO postseason between the Tucson Bears and the Nexon Heroes took place last night. Let's take a look at the highlights. Now, of course, going into the game here, scoreless game until the fourth inning. Two men on E1 suck an off-balance swing here, but it keeps going, going, and gone. A three-run shot to left field. And the Tucson Bears take a 3-0 lead. Meanwhile, Tucson starting pitcher Yuhi Guan not looking like a rookie pitcher in this game. Just absolutely lights out, throwing a no-hitter going into the eighth inning of the game until Kim Min Sung breaks the no-hitter and he's immediately taken out of the game. Meanwhile, shifting to the ninth inning, OJ one at bat. He's gonna ground this one to first. Park Byung Ho throws home and Hug Young Min is nailed at home. Still 3-0 Tucson. Bottom of the ninth, two man out. Here's Park Byung Ho and he says, Oh yeah, a three-run shot here ties the ball game, and the stadium goes wild. Stays that well until the third inning, inning when Che Jun Suk leads off with a solo shot to deep center field. 4-3 Tucson Bears. Next play, Min Byung Hun an RBI double to right makes it 5-3 Tucson. But check this out, OJ one at bat this time, and there it goes, a three-run shot to deep right field, and Tucson now takes a 8-3 lead. We go over to the 13th inning, Ite Gun two run shot to left, and it's now 8 to 5 Tucson. Miracle Nexon, forget about it. Ball game over, Tucson completes the reverse sweep and advances to the next round against the LG Twins. And now shifting over to football later tonight at the Chunan Sports Complex, the Korean national football team is set to face off against Mali. And trust me, this isn't going to be an easy match. Now, the 58th ranked uh, Korea is facing off against the 38th ranked Mali later tonight. And manager Hong Myung boasted that he will utilize the same lineup he used against Brazil. Despite the fact that it's just a friendly, Korea really needs the confidence at the moment. And beating the talented African team will do just that. Meanwhile, the match will kick off at 8 p.m. And speaking of the national team, former national team striker Lee chun Su is in trouble once again, and this time it's with the law. Police have questioned Lee chun Su regarding an incident that took place in the early Monday morning where a fight broke out between Lee and a customer at a bar. According to a witness, Lee chun Su broke about 20 bottles of beer out of anger, with Lee adding that he did not assault the quote-unquote victim. The Incheon United star, who also stated that he was just protecting his wife, who was getting verbally abused. Well, at least Monday was a better day for another athlete, and his name, Park Tae-hwan. Now, on Monday, the Park Tae-hwan Aquatic Center opened in Incheon. The 24-year-old Olympic swimmer joined the mayor of Incheon, Song young gil in the opening ceremony of the new aquatic center named after him. The center, which will seat over 3,000 people, will be used for the first time when the National Sports Festival kicks off on the 18th. Now, Park added that the facility is similar to what he saw during the Beijing Olympics and the Guangzhou Asian Games. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Bisphenol A, also known as BPA, has, is a substance that's become commonly known because it is contained in many things that are made of plastic. And it's known to not just harm children's uh, growth, but also their learning disabilities as well. It has an effect on that. And joining us to talk more about BPA and its effects is Dr. Alice hyun young Tan from Samsung Medical Center. Good, good morning, morning, Doctor. Good morning. Hi, good morning. So bisphenol A, or BPA, is something known as a uh, endocrine disruptor. In other words, it mimics the effect of estrogen in our body, mm. and it's contained in many plastic products, also thermal paper, and the epoxy resins that line almost all uh, food cans. So um, the problem is that BPA can be leached or transferred from these containers to our food and liquid or from the paper to our skin, and then it can be ingested. Mm. BPA has been linked to a number of conditions, but this is a controversial issue because 
evidence that directly implicates BPA in human disease is actually still lacking. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, medical societies have stressed that a precautionary principle be used when dealing with this substance, right. and they've emphasized that it should be avoided in pregnant women infants and children mm. as well. It sounds like something I don't want in my system. Let's go ahead and take a look at the dangers of BPA and how, what effects it has on our body. Canned foods are easy to eat and store, so they're a popular choice with many consumers. But to prevent corrosion, the inside of these cans are coated with epoxy resin, which contains bisphenol A or BPA. Bisphenol A or BPA is a chemical compound that is used in various capacities in our daily life. BPA is used not only in cans but instant noodle cups, convenience store lunch boxes, and plastic drink containers. According to tests on 1,089 third and fourth grade students between 2008 and 2009, those with 10 times more BPA levels than others showed a 107% increase in child depression or anxiety, while their calculation skills went down by 43%. The study also showed that BPA has an effect on the dopamine balance in the brain and influences the frontal lobe, having a critical impact on children's emotions, actions, and learning abilities. If you heat up the containers in a microwave oven, the BPA spikes up in amount compared to when left at room temperature. In the case of young children, because they touch and put many objects into their mouths when playing, there is a greater possibility that they will be exposed to higher BPA levels. The amount of BPA allowed in products in Korea stands at a maximum 0.6 ppm, much lower than Japan's 2.5 ppm. With this amount, half of it passes through the body within 24 hours. Because we consume BPA almost every day, it leaves the body daily as well. But on the other hand, it also means that our body carries the substance almost at all times. Consuming BPA can lead to learning disorders, obesity, asthma, heart diseases, and other lifestyle ailments such as diabetes. Starting July of last year, Korea has banned the manufacturing and import of all baby bottles with BPA due to the risks associated with the substance. The discussion on the dangers of BPA is ongoing, so it's important to be mindful of daily habits that might increase exposure to the chemical compound. Now we have some items that are laid out in front of us. Now all of these items can contain BPA, right? Now um, is, it all is it found in all plastic products? Should we be wary of all plastic? No, no, so it's not in all plastics. BPA is found in polycarbonate or PC plastics. And you can identify these pr plastic products by the number seven that's in the, the recycling triangle, uh -huh. the letter O or the word other that's printed on these plastics. Okay. Um, there are other plastics like polyethylene PET or PET plastics and polypropylene plastics that do not contain BPA. Hmm. Hmm. And we have some receipts here. I'm almost disheartened to know that there are BPA found in this, these receipts. Right, so BPA is used in the manufacturing of thermal paper, and that's the kind of paper that's used in point-of-sale point of receipts and also receipts from ATM machines. There was a study done in Korea that found that out of the 15 receipt types studied, 13 actually carried BPA. Mm -hmm. And so the results of these studies were used to sort of convince manufacturers to switch to BPA-free paper. Of course, um, the problem is that the BPA from the paper can be transferred to our hands and then from the hands to the mouth. And so it's prudent to wash your hands after handling receipts and make sure that they don't get in within hand's reach of infants and okay, children. Okay, so next time a store, store owner says receipts, you say no thank no. you. No, right, right. right. You, this is, you can use your too. smart mind boggling. Right. <laughs> really shocking than any of, the, any of the headlines that I delivered today. This is more <laughs> shocking news to me. But what's the best way to prevent exposure to BPA then? Right, so BPA can be released when it's exposed to heat. 
So make sure when you're microwaving your food, it's not in a polycarbonate containing plastic container. Huh. Also, um, you should try to use glass, porcelain, or stainless steel containers to store your food and liquid, especially if it's going to be hot. Mm. Avoid BPA containing baby bottles. Avoid canned foods whenever possible. And avoid eating foods that are prepackaged in plastic containers that use polycarbonate in which the food is coming in direct contact with the plastic. Mm. So these lifestyle changes can actually change how much BPA you take in. Ooh, wow. Okay, so be smarter about it too, right? Right, right. Okay. So when you go into the shopping, uh, shop, you know, supermarket, be wise, look at the labels, and um, when you're popping your food into the microwave, you ask yourself, is this safe? Is this You're going to be safe? looking at the packaging rather than the food now from, <laughs> from now on. No receipts. <laughs> no receipts. All right. Thank you very much, doctor, for your time this morning. You're welcome. All right. That ends <laughs> our segment on this Tuesday morning. And uh, have a great Tuesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 7 a.m. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. I'll never We're look at the We're unwilling to touch the receipt. <laughs>